Good day, everyone. My name is Neil Roberts. I teach Africana Studies, Political Theory, and the Philosophy of Religion here at Williams College. Um, and I also direct the Africana Studies Department and uh, the W. Ford Schumann 50 Program in Democratic Studies. So it's in my role and capacity as director of the Schumann Program uh, that I welcome all of you and I say good day because I realize that there are audience members in Williamstown, uh, in the United States, uh, in Haiti, and other parts of, uh, of the world. So thank you all for uh, joining. Um, I want to begin today with um, some thank yous. First to my colleagues in the Schumann program, Carrie Green, Veronica Bosley, and Carrie Pierce for uh, really helping to make this uh, event possible. <clears throat> Our esteemed guests, I would like to thank as well, and we'll have formal introductions momentarily, and also all of you for uh, joining us. Uh, in terms of the Schumann program, uh, there are a couple upcoming uh, events that we welcome all of you who are joining today uh, to uh, participate in. Uh, these will be forums via Zoom. The first is actually tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, which will be a, uh, a panel on a new book by Ethan Zuckerman. And the title of the event is Mistrust, Why Losing Faith in Institutions Provides the Tools to Transform Them. And then next week, Tuesday, March 16th, at, also at 7 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we'll be welcoming Isabel Wilkerson uh, to talk about her recent book, cast, uh, and it will be a conversation between Isabel Wilkerson uh, and Williams alum Kari Ramesh, uh, class of 2011, who is a lecturer currently at Harvard University. So why this forum today entitled Haiti, Beauty, and Justice in 2021, a conversation with Edris Danticat and Evelyn Chuyo. It's first very important to note that uh, our discussion today and conversation is in honor and in conjunction with International Women's uh, Day. That's first uh, and foremost. But second, which isn't in the title, uh, is a reminder. The ambassador, uh, Jean uh, Casimir, recently uh, in his work, uh, The Haitians of Decolonial History, emphasized uh, a well-known concept or rather expression, uh, Haitian expression, which is as follows, tout moun se moun, which has different translations. Uh, one translation might be every person is a person. Another translation might be all people are of equal value. Another translation uh, may uh, be tantamount to that we are all human. And this is a universal good. These are universal ideals of the human and also equality. And yet at the same time, the realization of treating one another as human and the realization of trying to treat one another uh, with equality and with respect continues to be not only aspirational, but also a challenge, realizable and yet one we are still working uh, towards. And so, in today's conversation, um, we are focusing on uh, Haiti. We are focusing on questions of beauty. We are focusing on uh, th the work of, uh, and the thought of three esteemed uh, Haitian women writers and intellectuals. But we're also talking about questions of not only justice, but injustice that as a whole uh, will be ones that we will be kind of uh, wrestling with together uh, as a group. And so um, uh, I wanna be brief, but I do wanna talk about, uh, just mention our format. Uh, after my uh, introduction to our moderator, uh, our two featured guests uh, will uh, have a combination of uh, reading from their work and also uh, ideas that they wanted to share with us. Uh, and then uh, Professor Regine Jean-Charles uh, will then um, moderate a, a conversation. And we're hoping to have approximately 30 minutes for questions from the audience. And so for those on your Zoom screen or your phone or however you're connecting, uh, we invite you to uh, post questions in, uh, in the, kind of the Q&A um, feature. 
and we will accept questions uh, not only in English, but also in French and uh, Creole. So to our, uh, to our moderator, Dr. Uh, Régine Michel Jean-Charles. Uh, Dr. Régine Michel Jean-Charles is a Black feminist literary scholar an associate professor of French and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College. She is the W. Ford Schumann Visiting Professor in Democratic Studies with appointments in Africana Studies uh, and French here at Williams. Her scholarship and teaching on world literatures uh, in French includes work on Black France, Sub-Saharan Africa, Caribbean eco-criticism, Haiti, and the Haitian diaspora. Her first book, very important, uh, entitled Conflict Bodies, The Politics of Rape Representation in the Francophone Imaginary, examines theoretical, visual, and literary texts in order to challenge global rape culture. She has numerous publications. Uh, she's authored over 30 publications that have appear appeared in books, edited volumes, and peer-reviewed journals. Uh, and uh, her recently completed second book, Looking for Other Worlds, Black Feminisms, Literary Ethics, in Haitian fiction is currently under contract with the University of Virginia Press. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Jean Charles is also a regular contributor to media outlets, including Miss Magazine, the Boston Globe, uh, American Magazine, and many others, where she has weighed in on topics such as the Me Too movement and issues affecting the Haitian diaspora. And last, actually really last but not least, because she doesn't know I'm going to say this, is that, um, and she might not remember, but Professor Jean Charles and I met when we were teenagers. Uh, I'm not going to say my, uh, when I was born, but let's suffice it to say we met when we were teenagers at a conference for undergraduate students. In re reflecting on uh, that moment and reflecting for today, I realized two things. One, how much I did not know about the world at that time. And secondly, how much Dr. Jean Charles did. Uh, and in many regards, whether you call it metaphysics or you call it the academy or a combination of both, um, it's been a delight to be able to uh, have Dr. Jean Charles um, kind of with us and, uh, and more importantly, uh, with you all for this moment. So I'm gonna turn off my screen and uh, turn it over to our moderator uh, for our event. And thank you again. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much, Neil, for that introduction. And thank you for the personal point at the end. I realize that we really have had such parallel journeys. So it's truly an honor for me to be able to call you a colleague, um, even if it's only for this semester at Williams. It is such an honor to be a part of this community. And I was so excited um, that I would also have the ability to host an event like this. And I'm just so thrilled um, to invite our speakers tonight. <clears throat> Tonight's theme, Aïti, Beauty and Justice, is inspired by a recent essay by one of our guests, Evelyne Trouillot. In the piece entitled Respecting the Diversity of Creativity, Trouillot explains, quote, in my writings, stemming from my lived experience and my aesthetic and social vision for a more beautiful and just world are presented to readers who are not always acquainted with my reality. It's the same for other writers who, like me, are translated into English or other languages. Our words become conduits, bridges, walkways that transport meaning, meaning, end quote. Indeed, both Trouillot and our other guest, Edwige Dantica, has through their writing been bridges and conduits and so much more. And I say this for me personally, as someone who first read their words when I was even younger than what Neil described, when I was in college, a freshman in college, and who has continued as a scholar um, and throughout my life, uh, been continued to be inspired by them in my teaching in my research and in my personal life. They have opened up new worlds. They have helped us to recall old ones and they have insisted that we imagine ones that may not yet exist. This commitment to humanity, to beauty and to justice that animates so much of their writing make them ideal interlocutors for this conversation about Aiti on the day after International Women's Day. Their creative visions for a more beautiful and a more just world are undergirded by an ethical imagination. They remind us that as Dantiquette writes in Create Dangerously, citing Camus, art cannot be a monologue. We are in high seas, end quote. And so I'll introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. First, we have Evelyne Trouillot. She lives in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and teaches in the French department at the Université d'État d'Haïti. 
She published her first book of short stories in 1996. In 2004, she received the Prix de la Romancière Francophone du Club Sor Optimiste de Grenoble for her first novel, Rosalie l'Infâme. In 2013, Rosalie l'Infâme was published in, English, in an English translation by Marjorie Salvaudon, another amazing Haitian woman writer, scholar, colleague, um, translation by the University of Nebraska Press under the title, The Infamous Rosalie. In 2005, Trouillot's first and very excellent piece of theater, Le Bleu de Lille, received the Beaumarchais Award from ETC Caraïbes. Trouillot has also published four books of poetry in French and in Creole. Her novel, La Mémoire aux Abois, was published in France by Edition au Bec in 2010, and it received the prestigious Prix Carbet de la Caraïbe et du Tout Monde in 2010. She has also published many other novels that aren't even listed here. Um, including most recently Désiré Congo, which was published in 2020. Edouard Danticat is the author of several books, including Breath Eyes Memory, Click Clack, a National Book Finalist Award, The Farming of Bones, The Dew Breaker, Claire of the Sea Light, and Everything Inside. She is also the author of the editor of The Butterfly's Way, Voices from the Haitian Diaspora in the United States. Best American Essays in 2011, Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir II. She has written seven books for children and young adults. And I should say both of these authors write for children and young adults, which is interesting. Um, Anna Kaun Up Behind the Mountains, Eight Days, The Last Mapu, Mama's Nightingale, Untwined, My Mommy Medicine, as well as the travel narrative after the dance. Her memoir, Brother, I'm Dying, was a 2007 finalist for the National Book Award and a 2008 winner of the National Book Circle Award for Autobiography. She is a 2009 MacArthur Fellow, a 2018 Ford Foundation, The Art of Change Fellow, and the winner of the Neustadt International Prize and the 2019 St. Louis Award. I'm so pleased to welcome these two women, these powerhouse women, these inspiring women, these women who have made a commitment to beauty and to justice and to looking at the world through different eyes in an otherwise fashion to be our speakers tonight. Welcome and happy International Women's Day the day after. <laughs> Evelyn and Edwidge. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take my video off. And um, and so we have the order of Evelyn and then we'll have Edwij. They'll just begin with a reading and then afterwards we'll have a conversation. Evelyn, I think you're muted. You're muted still, Evelyn. Maybe if the host could unmute you, that would help. Okay, do you hear me now? That's okay? Perfect, yep. Okay, well, uh, yes, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Asian, for the invitation. And uh, I know that the conversation will be uh, will be an uh, anxious and for us for and I I feel that talking with Edwidge and Regine will be a pleasure and I look forward to it. I want that you know I remember when I received the invitation from um, from Regine she mentioned Tony Morrison and she said that uh, she she referred to the quote by Morrison when she said that when civilizations are hurting, the artist has to work. The writers have to work, you know, because work uh, is the only way to heal the civilization when they're hurting. And, you know, I thought about that a lot. And especially in those past uh, uh, three years, I will say, because Haiti is living through some difficult times. And, I, I refer myself, I refer to the works of, uh, of a French poet, Wenichard, who said that in times of darkness, there is not one place for beauty, all the places for beauty. And I ask myself all the time, what is beauty? And beauty is work. 
is the artist's work. And I go back to Morrison. Beauty is our work, our, our way to create meaning, to create meaning from realities. We have to create meanings. And sometimes the realities are so dire, they are so difficult, they are so uh, dark, that's the word. They are, they are dark and we have to create beauty. Not uh, Beauty is not uh, joyfulness, you know, uh, uh, superficial joyfulness. It's a quest for meaning. That's what it is for me. It's a quest for meaning, it's a quest for meaning, it's a quest for humanity. Because the humanity is in us, is in everybody, whatever the context. And beauty is our work as creators, as writers, poets, is to make that beauty alive, come alive in us. That's that that that's why you know I was touched by the by the invitation of Regine when she mentioned the words of Tony Morrison because I think it's a big responsibility. You know, the the artist's work is a is a very big responsibility, and I um, I was thinking about all that this morning, and I said, how do you how do you find beauty? in what you live in, because sometimes people will ask, how oh, can you write here, it's so difficult. But it's difficult and it, it pushes you to find, to find a way to make beauty, to make the world as some sense, some meaning, and to make the humans around you uh, aware of the, the potential that they have, that the beauty that they have in themselves. And, I, I, you know, it's difficult to get into somebody else, you know, uh, mind. And this is the, the way, the way to go when you want to write. You don't write uh, about what you know only. You write about what you want to discover, you know, because this is a journey. This is an adventure. Writing is, is an adventure. And it will, it will um, make you reach the others, other people. And... Um, uh, I, the, the book I am going to, write, to read from, from it tonight is Memory at Bay, uh, La Memoire aux Abois. And I chose that book for, to, for, for the reason because uh, it's, uh, it's a book about dictatorship, about the Duvalier regime. And I think it's appropriate since what we're living in Haiti is uh, an attempt to go back to dictatorship. And when I was writing that book, I tried to put myself into Mrs. Duvalier's shoes, you know, to find a way to make readers understand what maybe was inside her mind. It was a very powerful woman who for decades was uh, at the head of the country with her husband. And a powerful woman that was also responsible for the destruction, for the despair of many families. And it was not easy for me to go inside, to try to go inside her mind and see what, is go what was going on. And how could she justify? What did she, what did she how, how did she talk to herself about what we were living as a, as, as a nation? And I tried to find a way, you know, to go inside. Eh? And I think this is this is what writing is about. This is not taking the easy way. This is taking the difficult way. This is a journey, and the journey is always difficult. And at the end, if we're lucky, you find the beauty. And that's that's why you know I keep on writing because if it was too easy, I don't think I will do it. it <laughs> there is a difficulty that is you know like a challenge, you know. So tonight, um, I, I'm going to read two extracts, two short extracts from that book. Uh, that was translated by Paul Curtis Daw, and in English. And I choose two extracts. One is about the killing, the assassination, the execution of two young um, Asian, two young men who, who were uh, part of a group called Jeune Haiti uh, and who in 1964, tried to overthrow the Duvalier regime and they were captured. And two of them were captured alive and they were brought to Port-au-Prince to be killed. 
And Duvalier being uh, Duvalier, <laughs> he imagined, he, he said that they, they had to be killed uh, uh, in a public execution. And he asked for the school children, for the government employees to come and look at the execution. And I was very small. I remember that I didn't go, of course, I didn't go. But I, people were talking about it, you know, in AD, on the Duvalier, people were always talking about it, but in very, very much stones, you know, you don't have to talk loud because you don't want people to know what you're talking about. And, but I remember, I remember people were murmuring, talking about it all the time. And in the book, I have, a, I have an extract, I have a, I'm going to read the extract where the, the protagonists learn about the execution of the two men. The government had ordered a massive turnout for the execution of the two men, guilty of having dared to defy the dictatorship. Elementary school pupils, middle and high schoolers, university students and government workers were let out early to watch the spectacle, which in addition would be televised and rebroadcast so many times that no one could avoid seeing the bullet riddle corpses. Your parents, following the example of many others, kept you at home. But how could they keep you from imagining the grisly atmosphere that hung over the city? The nausea experienced by so many spectators, the murderous shears of the Doravelis, elated at their openness punishment, the horrified silence that paralyzed the onlookers and froze even the sky. Without your parents' knowledge, your brother jean edouard recently graduated from high school, slipped away from the family home to witness the execution. Fascinated, in spite of himself, impelled by a need to act in some as yet undetermined way. When he returned, still shaken by the violence of the scene, he shut himself up in his bedroom. Afterward, he told the story in short sentences with great swaths of silence that even you didn't dare interrupt. His voice quivered with astonishment and pride as he spoke of the condemned defiance in the face of the executioners. His eyes glowed with admiration, like the gunfire flashing in the chaos. He gave you the precious gift of a fury stronger than fear, the invaluable heritage of dignity and courage. And this part I didn't, you know, imagine it was the it was the it, it was it was real the two young men so young to die like that you know in front of everybody they were very courageous and you can see of course the 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 the, the i think it it is on youtube you can find them you can find the execution and this is very very sad and very revolting to see two young people being killed like that on the duvalier and the the, the other extract the last one i'm going to read is uh, it's about the young, the protagonist of the of the novel, who is uh, imagining a world without dictatorship. You know, in 1950, I think it was it was in 1959, Duvalier suffered a massive heart attack, and people thought he was going to die. And the young girl is asking herself, what what would have happened? What if he had died that day? You know, 1959, because he survived until 1954. I wonder what would have happened if Doreval had succumbed to the first attack. How many lives would have been spared? How many families would not have experienced the disappearance of a brother, a cousin, a daughter? How many nightmare, night, nightmares would no longer have the reason for being? Like warning a film backward, I take the liberty of reworking his story. I restore life to the young man gone down one rainy evening because the Totomac cook wanted to kiss the man's fiance. I return a smile to the careworn face of the mother who for six years until her death went to the police headquarters every morning to inquire after her two sons who had been arrested for their communist view. Suddenly, I cover the walls of the city in blue to hide the stains of the blood spattered there with no regard for aesthetics and I transformed the huge prison of infamous name into a massive history museum. 
for the sum, bastion of shame, of ravaged corpses, crippled backs, mangled fingers, and broken hearts. I dedicate it as a place of commemoration for the victims, the martyrs, for all those who are remembered, but above all, for those men and women who are never spoken of, always more numerous, the anonymous multitude so often remain, remains invisible to the eyes of posterity. And for me, this is the biggest thing because even if we write the stories, many, many stories, we will still have anonymous and nobody talks about them. For me, this is a painful you know, reality. And I always try to find a way to make the anonymous visible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Indian. This is like, I have so many things I want to say, but I have to be quiet. <laughs> Um, and thank you. And of course, Edwidge, I can't help but think of the way that you open Create Dangerously, right? So there's a connection here, but I'll let you go and then we can talk. All thank right. you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Regine. I didn't realize, Regine, that you were such a precocious teenager, <laughs> um, already <laughs> thinking of these issues so long ago. And um, it's wonderful to be uh, speaking to Evelyn again, this is not our first conversation on the record, so to speak. Um, we, we had a conversation before that was in Bomb Magazine that you all can go and revisit after this one. So it's wonderful to be um, with you tonight. And um, as Evelyn was uh, reading, um, I, thought, I, I thought of, um, and Toni Morrison was um, mentioned, and I thought of, um, you know, being asked to give this lecture. And, and I thought, what could I bring about my experience to say in front of Toni Morrison? And it started with these young men and, um, and their return to Haiti and that execution. And that really ha was how Create Dangerously started. And I remember, you know, she would retell and I told their story, I told their story in the lecture and I told um, the story of this photographer friend, Daniel Morel, who was at the execution and, um, and decided that, that like when, after he was forced to witness that and then would see propaganda about what had actually happened. And he was like, I wanna do that, but for good. And, and, um, and about Felix Maurice Ulloa who translated Antigone. And, um, you know, he was, he lived here in the neighborhood where I, uh, you know, he was often here in Little Haiti. Um, and I got to see him a little bit uh, towards the end of his life. And, you know, he would tell that story of staging Antigone um, and Creole as a, as a protest against dictatorship, right? And Toni Morrison would retell that story. She told it, retold it a couple of times. Um, and that was sort of an, like such a, a great honor. So in a way that her, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful that that she comes in this conversation as well. I mean, there's another quote from her about art and, and beauty. She said, art invites us to know beauty and to solicit it, summon it from even the most tragic of circumstances. Um, so I, I, I feel like that is appropriate um, tonight. Um, and I, what I'll read from is Claire of the Sea Light, which is, um, it's a, a short passage from that, which I thought, which I think brings together uh, a little bit, at least for this little girl in the story, um, beauty and Haiti and, and justice. Initially, I wanted to write that Claire of the Sea Light, the whole book as a radio show, because I grew up listening to the radio and I, I thought it would be like each chapter would be an episode. And there was a woman in the, in the book who is a, like a heroine for me. She, her name is uh, Louise George. And since she couldn't get justice, like since the women couldn't get justice in this town, Ville Rose, which is modeled after Leogan where my mom was born. And so she wanted, she would do, do a radio show where, where the women could come and tell their, 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 what had happened to them and like shame their uh, people who had assaulted them. And so that was the initial uh, idea of the book, but uh, it went into this other more personal space, I think, which is also sort of like the crevices of beauty or to me are very fascinating, like the lacuna, so um, this, this passage is about Madame Gaël who lost her husband in a, in a very violent act. And then there's a little girl in the town who was born as a, 
uh, her mom died in childbirth and then her father's been trying to give her to Madame Gael. And this is the brief moment where Madame Gael decides um, to take her. So. When she finally made it to the beach, Madame Gael spotted a group of little girls. They were holding each other's hands and moving clockwise in a circle, a singing circle, a one. She was too far away to hear what they were singing, but she could hear their laughter. Each girl, it seemed, trying to outdo the next. They were the happiest people on the beach. Six little brown and black angels skipping around, fallen sea hearts and sand dollars. Madame Gaël moved slowly, not wanting the pleasure of her approach to end. She had played the wound as a child during school recess and at night in her parents' yard with visiting friends. What she remembered most about playing the wound though was always holding someone else's hand. It would have seemed odd she if she told someone how much she wanted to take all those little girls home, set them up in the many empty rooms of her house, and whenever she was sad, asked them to play the one with her. There were many days when she wanted to grab any little girl off the street and hold her in her arms just to inhale her smell, the smell that the men she slept with lacked. Their smells were musty. They smelled of roads and dust and cologne that never quite covered their must. They smelled of work, of sweat, of other women. But little girls smelled of roses and wet leaves, of talcum powder in the dew. In spite of every, what everyone had told her after her daughter died, longings like this had never subsided. And her losses had not made her stronger. They had made her weak. They had given others control and power over her. She didn't want to continue being weak, but she didn't want to die either. She was too eager to see what would come next, what her husband and daughter had missed. She was both hungry for life and terrified of it. Her evenings with the men she slept with let the rage and confusion disappear for a while and allowed her to make it through her days. They allowed her to sell bread and cloth and remain very close to the graves of the people she loved. There were times that she wanted to take off, leave Ville Rose, leave the country and never come back. But she had heard too much about the difficulties of starting a new life in another land to really want to try. She had heard about people who had been infantilized while learning a new language, people who ended up cleaning houses or wiping the asses of other people's children. She saw these people return to Ville Rose at Christmas or in the summertime with extravagant hairstyles and expensive looking clothes, but their eyes always betrayed them. All the humiliation they had endured could be detected there. Their skins betrayed them too. The burns from the dry cleaner steamers or the car wash or the restaurant's kitchen as visible as brands on animals. No, none of that was for her. Her ancestors on both sides were buried at the town cemetery among the town's oldest families. She could never be diaspora. She liked her ghost nearby. She could never live in a foreign land and return only a few times a year. She could not ever risk dying and being buried in a cold place. She would always be here, she thought, like the two large boulders that stopped her feet when at last she reached those little girls. As she sat on one of the boulders and watched one of the girls, Claire realized that she was being washed and occasionally grins her way like her mother, Claire was beautiful. She moved more gracefully, more purposefully than the rest of the girls, even the ones who were older. Gael walked over to the girls and immediately her presence stopped the one. Do you remember my daughter? The girl's father often asked Gael when they saw each other. How could Gael forget a child that she had nursed as a baby on the very night that she was born? A child who was so gentle and docile even on that first day and had grown so lovely and radiant each passing year. Claire's eyes seemed to light up the way children's eyes light, eyes light up when they're hungry for stories. I knew your mother, Gael said, 
Your mother was and will always be my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I love Claire so much. And I love that passage um, with the one. And so I, I actually want to deviate <laughs> um, because it occurs to me that these two texts that each of you read from tonight. So La Mémoire aux Abois was published in 2010 and Claire of the Sea Light in 2013. Um, and I think you both know that, you know, I'm working on a project about Haitian girls and Haitian girlhood and how we see them and how they're seen. Um, and both of these texts actually have these girls, right? So I think about Evelyn in La Mémoire aux Abois, those stories about the, the, the other protagonist, right? When she was young and what she recalls, right? So that thinking about, you know, Haitian girls under the regime and what they see. And then of course, Claire being this, you know, girl protagonist who's also, it's all about her, but there are ways in which she's absent. And so I wanna use that as a jumping off point to um, just talk to both of you about your visions and your dreams and your hopes for, for Haitian girls, um, as well as the work that you've done with and for and on behalf of and alongside Haitian girls. Um, one of the things that I often cite is this interview that really irks me that Oprah did right after the earthquake. Um, and it was like Oprah's special, post-earthquake special. And she asks, um, she asked this woman who's a white woman who runs an orphanage in Haiti. And she says, does it make sense to dream as a Haitian girl? And, you know, it bothers me <laughs> because she's asking someone who is not a Haitian girl. And then the, the idea that like Haitian girls wouldn't have dreams, right? When we know that they do, they have dreams, they have visions, they have robust imagination. So I would just ask both of you um, on this International Women's Day, you know, how, how do Haitian girls inspire you, first of all, I would say, and then also what, it, what are your dreams um, for Haitian girls and, and how is your work inspired by them? We could start with Evelyn. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, I don't know if uh, Asian girls inspire me. I just realized that I write a lot about women and girls. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's the way it is. And I don't try to change it because this is the way, you know, when I look at the world, uh, I see so many things I want to say about girls and women. So I just do it. My dream for the Asian girls and for Asian women, because the girls, hopefully they will become women. I think they, first of all, uh, is to give them the ability to, to be educated because education is a big problem. It's a big problem in Haiti for everybody, but especially for the girls, I think. And I think we have, as a society, we have a lot to do about that. We have. Uh, Education can change the way people see things also. And when I think about education, I see also education for the men to look at women differently. You know, not only the, the, the men, the girls, but the boy also has to be educated to, to, to learn how to respect girls or to, you know, talk to girls or to see girls or, or, as equals, as different but equals. But um, we have a lot to do as society because we have a lot of violence, especially when the situation is difficult. There is a lot of violence against girls. I think that's it, and women. I think it's everywhere. The pattern, you know, that the people who are at risk, the children, the women, they suffer a lot when the situation becomes diff difficult in, the, in, uh, in uh, cases of war, of conflicts they are the first one to suffer. And in Haiti, we have a lot of violence against women in the popular neighborhoods, in the poor neighborhoods, because the gang members use them from sometimes as, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to try to influence the, the outcomes of the conflicts. And I think, uh, but apart from that, uh, this, uh, I think uh, we have also to find a way to mix the women independent economically you know not to be not to not to be so uh 
dependent of the men that they have to they, they have to suffer and accept everything. That's that's the problem. You know, you know, we are in a poor in a poor society, and sometimes the women they they enter a cycle where they will make, we will have a child with a man because the man is supposed to be taking care of the child, but the man doesn't do it, so they have a child with another boy, another man, and the other man doesn't take care of the one, and they have a child, and this goes like that for a long time, and at the end they have four five children without a, a, a father really present to take care of the kids, to help take care of the kids. And this is a problem. So I think uh, when they say that the, the Asian women, they work a lot, of course they work a lot. And I was looking at the movie, Mada Sara, uh, I was looking at it on, on, uh, for, the, for the second time. And this is the problem in Haiti, we have the women working and they don't have the authority or the power that goes with the amount of work that they, that they, they, they put into society, again, into their families. And I think we have to change that, but changing that is taking a long time. And the, the thing I try to do for me is by, by, educating, by educating the young girls. I think we can make a difference if we try early with the young girls and make them see themselves, you know, as human, human beings worth of, you know, uh, edu being educated, being to you know, have the right to work, have the right to to love their bodies, and you know, and choose what they do with their bodies, because this is a very important part, also. You know, the way they want to, um, you know, do their hair, the way they want to walk, the kind of clothes that they want to put on. I I don't know different things, but I think in Haiti the the situation is very complex. We are not in a society where really we can say that uh, it is like other society where the woman cannot drive or the woman cannot do this or that. But there is, at the same time, there is a lot of violence against women in the songs. In the songs, you, you hear a lot of violence against women in the, in, in, in the language. Every day language, you have violence against women, you know? And every, everybody accepts it like it's normal. It's not normal to talk about women like that. And this is, a, I think education and can work can, and also the laws. We have to take laws to make, you know, people, you know, uh, face justice when they do things like rape, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, harassment and other things. So we have a lot of work to do, you know, but I am not discouraged. I think sometimes, you know, you see the results, you know, they are slow because changing mentalities is, cannot be done, you know, quickly. But I think we have uh, uh, there is some progress. But unfortunately, when they are when, when when society is going through a different times, we regress, and this is what's happening. In a, you know, um, I guess my my answer to that would be through the filter. Like I I have a lot of. I have a big family and a lot of young girls in, in the family. And I think because now of the communications methods makes it easier for us to be in contact in a real day to day. And some, and they are, you know, you there, if, if a girl is in a, a certain neighborhood, there's, there's fears. And, and for example, you, you, we've had girls, um, that I've been in touch with who will say, well, this person is in Brazil and says that they will buy me a ticket if I can come to Brazil. So I think there, there, there's a kind of desperation for, for, cert, for some girls in um, certain areas that lead to very desperate choices with, and with a lack of support. Um, but what I've seen that's hopeful is um, certain, sometimes very individual initiatives that people take on that we don't hear about that are not NGOs, for example, so my mother-in-law is um, is in the south, and and she would notice where she was um, that girls came um, over the summer from Port-au-Prince, and you know who were in school in Port-au-Prince, and they were there. They didn't have much to do, so they would get in. You know, they would some of them would get pregnant. So she started in her lacou. She started this camp, this sewing camp, and and my girls would be part of this camp. And at the end of the summer. We had like a fashion show and people won prizes. And that was one 80 year old woman who came up with this idea and that grew into like a sewing school, a technical school. So I think um, 
one way that's hopeful is to support initiatives like that, right? To support those kinds of, um, and a lot of people who have those ideas or, you know, to, to try to support those sort of lower funded, lesser known types of um, initiatives, as well as more known, you know, uh, spaces where women and, you know, women and girls and, and also interact with men. Like recently we were, um, I was doing a, a workshop with Nadine uh, Paul Deleroy with Asip YT, and I and we were talking like you're having this discussion, and I kept you know we're like we're, I kept saying like where are the women? Where are the women? like there were a lot of women there, but I think also facilitating um, these spaces and you know and encouraging um, initiatives um, locally, um, and I and the arts is a powerful me you know mechanism for that too. I think to to both for self-expression and um, and so, but my hope, my hope for, for Haitian girls is that each one of us um, in whatever way we can, if we will mentor, will mentor a girl in some way, right? Um, not just with money, but sometimes with advice or with, with, um, with support, you know, no matter what our station in life, we can make a difference in at least the life of one girl. That's so true. That's so true. And there's just that relationship, the idea of being, you know, proximal is, is so important in that. And I know that both of you just, you live that out. So thank you. Um, and so I want to, I was very happy, um, uh, Evelyn, when you started talking and you mentioned, I think the original email that I sent you when I was talking about Toni Morrison's essay from 2015, um, that this is, and she says, you know, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair. There is no time for, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. And I was really happy, you know, of course, Edwidge has a very personal relationship with Toni Morrison, may she rest in peace. Um, and that this was an inspiration for both of you. And I, I, so I wanted to talk about, you know, this, the current situation in IT right now, and both of you um, have written publicly about this um, in different forums. And I, I, I wanted to know, you know, how do you understand the responsibility of the writer or the artist in this moment? And what is the role of the Haitian artist committed to beauty and justice in a time such as this? You want to start it, did you? <laughs> oh, I thought we we're alternating. <laughs> well, I guess I can also add though, <laughs> because what's interesting is the last, con so the last, your last public conversation was in 2004, the one for Bon Magazine. It was right after the flooding in Gonaive, right? And so we can also think about this as, you know, the two of you in light of that conversation, the two of you coming together in these particular moments of, you know, disruption that are fraught and difficult periods for us, you know, um, as a people? Um, well, I think, I mean, for me, I, I resist the, the thing of, as an artist, like having all the answers. I don't have all the answers, right? And if you, um, at least the kind of family I come from, like, I can, like, I can say something and someone will be like, you are so wrong. Like within my own family, uh, there are, there's always like very contrary uh, political discussions happening. So I, so I always feel like my role in, in these moments is to support people in whatever way I can who are doing the day-to-day -day work, um, to bear witness as James Baldwin said, you know, um, what I, and I saw a, a, an incredible model here in Miami doing the George Floyd protest. So when we went to, to the protest over the summer here, artists made signs, they drummed, they were dancing, there were poetry recitals, they gave money, some brought masks, some wrote things, you know, some fed people. So I don't, I, I think you also have to listen to sort of what, what people on the ground are doing, and then we contribute where we are, right? Um, and, and for some people, it's not gonna be enough. For others, you know, it's, you know, just, I think um, my friend Aja, Aja Monet, who was here in the community, sort of a, like the consummate, like artist activist, you know, you know, always said this, it's about, it's about, you know, your, your, your presence. And you, you just, 
you contribute what you can because also artists are your are citizens right we have um concerns we have we have um you have blood in the game if you will right and in so many cases so i think but but it's also to um to respect the voices of others and to also respect the the voices of people who've been doing the work for you know for 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 so very long and to stand with them um more than to stand in front of them is my is my um is the way i feel about it well i think uh, i think in times of uh, crisis or whatever it is a natural catastrophe like the the flooding in 2004 the um do in 2010 or what are we what we're going to now i think uh, the the writer the artist cannot stay apart or away from it you are anyway what are, what whatever you your thinking is it will affect you okay that i think i think that's the first thing but how are you going to react how are you going to react uh, i think uh, for me, the, the thing is always to go to the majority of the people. How do they live through it? You know, because if I if I go to from my from my own you know uh, point of view, my own perspective, my own little, little little world, you know, it will not be for me. It will be like uh, it will be too easy and and just in a way. You know, so I try to listen, and I I, I agree with uh, Edwidge. We don't have all the answers. I try to listen to others and see what are they going through, what are they living. You know, what is the experience that they that 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 they are going through? And I remember for the flooding in uh, 2004, I was listening to a mother, uh, a grandmother, and a mother telling us about her, her family who stayed on, on, on the tree for days because they couldn't go down because of the water. And I was trying to imagine, you know, I, what, what, what would I do if I was, you know, in that person's place and it's awful. And this is what I say when I, when I, I was talking about the responsibility to create beauty. Create beauty is create meaning, is make other people understand what people are going through in terms of crisis and take a stand too. Sometimes we have to take a stand about what is going on because we are also citizens. When I write, I'm not even the writer and the citizen stay apart. I am citizen, I'm, I'm Asian. When I write, I'm a black Asian woman. I don't say, no, I'm a writer now. I'm not a black Asian woman anymore. No, I write with all my feelings, all my 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 body, every, everything that is me eh? and then so my convictions, my idea, my uh, my opinions about things go through my writing. Although you know this, I was I was um, I was reading an article that uh, a good friend of mine, Christiana Shu, wrote about uh, Clara Setkin, who is a feminist, uh, who was a feminist German, and she wrote um, Clara Setkin is before all alive because she would, Clara Setkin wrote a lot about the feminist movement and everything. And she said she is, before, before everything, she is, she is alive. Because what are ideas if they don't coincide with your existence? And I think it's beautiful. I think I can have many ideas, but if what I live, what I go through, do not correspond with what am I writing, I'm just a, you know, fraud. I'm a fraud. You know, uh, so I try to, I try to, it's not, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy. And sometimes my writing goes uh, uh, further than what I, it push me, pushes me to go in my, in my actions, you know, because it's so, it's, it will be so easy just to write and say, well, uh, well, I'm writing and I'm writing, I am for justice, I'm for this, I'm for that. But if around me, I cannot also try to make a difference, I, 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 I will not be comfortable with myself. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what I can say. 
I you love know? that. I love that. I love that so much, Evelyn. What you're saying resonates with me very deeply. Um, it makes me think of a, a quotation that I, you know, have actually as the epigraph of my book, um, along with a quotation from Kathy Mouse. But it's Farrah Jasmine Griffin, who's a Black feminist literary scholar, and she was my mentor when I was at Penn. And she says, um, "Black feminism has never only been about Black women. It's never been this. It's about a more just world." And a planet that says that if you listen to the insights of the least of these, which is us, we could do something transformative. And so what I hear and what you're saying is listening to the majority, right? Listening to people who are marginalized. And that when if, if we can look to that, if we can listen to that, then everybody benefits, right? Like this is like a very basic principle. Then everybody will learn. Everyone, will, that's where the vision should really come from. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and for allowing me to put those two things in, in conversation together. Um, ah, I have so many questions, <laughs> I can't ask all of them. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pandemic, okay? Cause you know, it was a big thing. Um, so both of you published new fiction in 2020. We had Desiree Congo by Evelyn Trouillot and we had um, Everything Inside by Ed Edwidge Jantikat. And so I wanted to know, you know, how did you, first of all, how do you see these works engaging our themes of beauty and justice? Um, and Aitsi, of course, um, but also how did the context of the pandemic just affect the rollout of those books for you? Maybe not only just practically and logistically, but intellectually and personally. Um, well, for me, Everything Inside was 2019, um, oh, yeah, yeah, thankfully. Um, but in 2020, I did, I wrote one piece of fiction. It was called One Thing. It was in a, a, a series of stories uh, that were uh, sort of inspired, inspired by the Decameron, which was a book that was written about the, the, uh, the, bonnet, the plague um, in Florence, where like, a bunch, like some people went into quarantine and they, they told each other stories. So that was the one piece I wrote. And I, and I, the, the process of it, I, for me, so I, I wrote about a couple, a young couple, one is in the ICU and, and then the um, wife is telling him their story. You know, it's like a very, it, I wrote it at the very beginning of the pandemic. It might've been too soon to write fiction, but it was at that point that I was attending so many Zoom funerals, you were getting so many of the Facebook links to watch, you know, services that, that I wanted to, I mean, I, I, I was resisting fictionalizing, but I, but I wanted to have something that 10 years from that I could remember, oh, this is what I was um, thinking, like sort of like, this is what I was trying to make um, in 2020. So thankfully there was no rollout, but I, I got to learn this whole medium of talking to people. I've gotten, you know, to uh, be in conversation like tonight and, and other uh, conversations with other people um, throughout the, that this year of, of change. So that's what it's uh, it's been creatively just kind of trying to keep together having kids at home and doing Zoom and trying to like work in the space together, which I um, which I'm still learning. I'm still processing. Um, I'm very happy that this is all going well tonight, but it doesn't always <laughs> As, as far as roll, rollouts and programs are concerned. And what, Evelyn, what about I, I have to say that this is true. I wrote it before, before the pandemic also, I think it was 2019. And, and during the pandemic, I was re reviewing the, my poetry book. I have a poetry book that will come out soon. It is with the publisher uh, in French. And also one that came out in Creole in 2020. So that I was into poetry during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't think anything about the pandemic. I have to say that uh, I always write after. You know, it has, I have to process the, these things. For the, for the earthquake, it was the same. I, I couldn't write immediately, you know. I have to process it. But I understand the need to to write it down so you have a you have a testimony mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow mm -hmm. of how it was. But I, I will write about it probably later. But how does the Desiree Congo relate to the themes? I think the themes is AD, beauty and justice. And I take beauty, the beauty I found in I tried to 
show in Desiree Congo is the beauty of the relationships between the people. Mm -hmm. I think friendship and love, you know, there is such a beauty in the, I don't know, in human relationships. I think we have to, in, in, in times of darkness, we have to emphasize that there is such beauty in loving people, love between a man and a woman, between two women, like what happened in the Congo, or between a mother and, 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 and a son, or between two friends, the friendship between two friends, I think is, is beautiful. And I, I try to make it show, to, to, to make it come alive in the books. And justice, of course, is in this way Congo because they are fighting for their dignity. And there is beauty also in dignity. Every time you think about the, about the justice, about the grandeur of the, you know, of human being, you think about dignity. You know, you cannot be a human if you don't have any dignity. That's for me, it's a basic thing. You have to have the respect, self-respect, and people have to respect you and you have to fight for it if you don't have it. That's the, the bottom line. And I think uh, Desiree Congo, I think uh, it, is in there somewhere, you know, the fight for, for justice, for beauty, you know, beauty and uh, it's painful sometimes, but it's there. And um, that's why I think uh, the team, IT, Beauty and Justice, it was very good. Thank you, bravo, Regine, for that, <laughs> for that team. It's because it, 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 combine, it combines so many things. You know, so many strong elements together. 80, of course, are, but beauty and justice together, I think it's very, very strong because you can, you can see the rapport. If, if you don't see it, you know, you can, you can, you can find it somewhere, you know, in your life, in your life, even beauty and justice, because it's difficult to be, to have beauty if you don't have any justice, mm. you know, talking about the young woman. If you don't have, you know, if the young women, if the young girls are not free, they cannot be themselves. Mm -hmm. How can they be beautiful? You know? Yeah. You know, you have to, you have to fight for beauty. Beauty is not a vain word. Mm -hmm. Beauty is very important in the world. That's fascinating that you say that. And we're going to open it up to questions. But I will say um, before that, you know, in the class that I'm teaching at Williams, Tropical Ecologies, our first book was Rosalie Lanfam. And, you know, obviously there's so much injustice, right? Um, and there's so much beauty. And that was one of the things that I think really struck my students is to read this book that's about this time and the, the way that you write about the violence of slavery, the violence of the lived experience of the enslaved in such a beautiful place, but also with so many beautiful words, right? Like as you explained that story about the Baracol and the way that they talk about, you know, the captivity, it's beautiful. Um, but it's like so painful, right? Which again, brings us to Morrison, right? And thinking about, you know, how do you, speaking the unspeakable or how do you write something that is just so difficult, but you as authors still manage to do so with beauty. It's the same thing in Farming of the Bones, right? It's a devastating thing that's happening, but you as authors are able to capture the beauty even as you write about injustice. But I can't let you respond to that because we have <laughs> questions. <laughs> I, have be, I have to be timekeeper. Um, I just want to- Yes, Big Brother is back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but uh, Eveline, uh, Edwidge, uh, Regine, this is such a kind of powerful conversation for those of us kind of listening and learning. So thank you. Um, and so for those who might not have joined us uh, at the beginning of, uh, of our event, um, we really welcome your questions. If you can use on your screen or your device or however you're connecting the Q&A feature uh, to, post some uh, to post your questions. Actually, during the conversation uh, that was going on, there were even audience members who were um, kind of putting in the chat some of the books uh, and, and, and items that were being referred to. So uh, that's been helpful. And so what we are going to do is we're uh, you know, inviting questions uh, in English, but also in uh, French uh, and Creole. And so uh, I am initially going to begin uh, with a couplet of questions that I think can begin to um, uh, take some of these audience questions and continue the conversation. Uh, and likely uh, between Regine and myself, we might kind of go back and forth in terms of posing the questions. But these first two, I think, actually speak to all, uh, to all three of you. Um, and so uh, the first question uh, comes from uh, Shiara uh, uh, Pierhus. Uh, who uh, very tersely and directly asked, 
um, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? So in other words, what advice do you have for uh, aspiring writers? Uh, and then the second question uh, comes from Phil uh, Julian, uh, who writes uh, the following. As authors, Haitian authors, how do you think your writings can influence not just our young Haitian girls, but our boys as well? Influence the boys to recognize the strength of Haitian women, not just as their mothers, but the saviors of society. Influence for the girls so that they can reach their fullest potential as powerful and positive Haitian women. So those, uh, there's a lot in those two questions. And then, um, you know, uh, I think this is something that uh, all three uh, could answer, but um, those two questions, and then we'll take some others afterwards. Uh, I'll, I'll take a, a crack at this uh, for Phil. It sounds like Phil can do it. it was like, I love the passion of that question. Um, I think one way that I, I try to do it is by actually going beyond the, the book, right? To try to meet in whatever way possible when you can with, with young people um, and, um, and to tell the, you know, to, to tell your own personal story, but also to expand, to go beyond, beyond the pages. Uh, because often, you know, even in, you know, in classrooms here, they, they feel like, oh, this is a woman's story. But, um, but there, you know, I think just like we can all put out, like that's the power of literature and that you can put yourself in, in, in the, the space of a reader. But taking it beyond the book, having conversations uh, also, I think is inspiring. What advice would I give to to a writer? I think it's to to read and write as much as write as much as possible. It's like I think we don't stress enough the discipline and practice of writing. Musicians, you know, if you want to be great, you have to practice a lot. It's, I think it's the same. We have to also make it seem like with writing, people expect the gods to come and for it to come. But there's you know, it's like discipline to try to work consistently and show up. I agree. I think writing is work. You know, people forget this. You say talking about passion, and uh, sometimes they say this: he has skill, he has talent. But this is work. You have to work, and you have to have some discipline if you want to go. For, you know, I don't know to go as far as you want in terms of what you want to realize, what you want to accomplish. But uh, I think the the writing itself is important. Is important. Uh, and I think the question was, uh, how do you influence boys also, not only girls, right? Mm -hmm. And it goes back to what I was saying. I think if you want to change, you have to work with boys and girls. You cannot write with, work with girls only. But the thing is, you know, the, the writing can help. In a way, for example, in Rosalie Le Femme, in the infamous Rosalie, I try to show how women were important what history doesn't really talk about women's role, you know? And in Desiree Congo also, I think, you know, you have a narrative about the story that go the, all the heroes were men and they don't see the woman. And when the, the child, when children grow like that, they think that women, you know, they are there, but they, they don't do too much. So you have to change it, but you, uh, 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 a fiction, can do a lot towards changing people's mentality. And I, 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 I meet a lot of readers and they are both men and women, believe me. And, that, and they say, oh, I love that book because I learned so much about Asian history I didn't know before. And I feel happy about that because I, this is not only the women who find themselves in the book, the, 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 the men also. And the, but I agree with uh, Edwidge when she said meeting with the, with the readers. And I try to do that because in Haiti, and it's very positive thing, we have a lot of little groups, you know, cultural centers in, in the province. And sometimes they invite you. And I always try, I try to go most of the time, but now it's a different story because of the pandemic and the, the situation has changed. But and it's always a pleasure and to meet them and talk to young people especially because they are the one who comes to these things and they ask you things, what should I do? What should I write? What should I read? And you know, and this is the uh, a conversation that brings, that brings a lot to me. I'm not the one giving, we are exchanging. 
That's the way I see it, you know? And I think uh, I grow from those conversations and uh, they are important in your work as a writer to see how people see your work also. Because sometimes you have something in your mind and it's not, <laughs> it's not the perception that people have. And I, I, I treasure these meetings, you know? Yeah, can I just, I, Baina Bello has a wonderful series on, there's one called Sheroes of the Haitian Revolution that, that you can like read with boys too. But I, in terms of the meetings, I remember I had a funny encounter one time where I was at this library with, with some um, young people in Haiti and one of the kids raised their hands and said, uh, to, you know, tout n'a pas les politiques. Why doesn't, why doesn't one of you write Harry Potter or something like that? <laughs> and I thought, it was like, why don't you write a, like, they're like, why don't you write a space story? And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. Like, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so those encounters can be really, really, really fun. <laughs> But that, can I, I jump in that point in terms of, you know, Jamaica Kincaid has mentioned this, right? In terms of yeah. thinking about Caribbean literature across the linguist, across the islands, across the territories, when she said, I just want to write a book on, you know, gardening. <laughs> does that fit in with, uh, does that fit in or not with Caribbean literature, but also questions of kind of politics and, and, and society and beauty and, and justice, but there is an aesthetic dimension too, to that. And so, um, uh, given the kind of the, the thrust of this conversation, um, there's another couplet of questions that um, take us in a different direction, but, um, but still very uh, poignant. Uh, the first comes from uh, Lorna, uh, who writes, what is the role of spirituality in creating beautiful worlds? What does beauty and practice look like? Uh, and then a second question from Andrew Rule, who writes, uh, Mademoiselle Trio, you wrote in Rosalie La Femme that the story was inspired by an enslaved African woman you encountered in an archive. Can you both talk about the role of the archive in your writing and about how your respective uh, works might be, I gather in the question, be viewed as, a, as an archive? That you're, do you see your own works as an archive um, uh, themselves? Yeah. Well, that's true that I, I, uh, I like that. I encountered the, the character, that's true, <laughs> in the story because I didn't invent, uh, I didn't create the, this uh, personage, this character. It was really a woman, a midwife. And I read about her because I read a lot to write, uh, to write uh, Rosalie L'Enfam and Desiree Congo. And I read about the story and I wanted to, to, to give her a story, to give her, to make her a life. So I invented all the details because they were not in the, in the history book. And I think archives are, for me, for me, since I write uh, historical novels, they are very, very important because uh, I, I try to, I try to stay into the context, into, into the historical context, even though I go as far as I can in the fiction with my characters, but I respect the details, the context. And to do that, I have to read, I have to read a lot. I have to read a lot, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work reading all this and then trying to, to select all, uh, among all those reading what I'm going to keep, you know, because sometimes you are tempted to put everything, but you cannot do that. And there are so many strong pieces. You have to disregard some of them, but uh, for me, it's very important. And I think, uh, I cannot say my word will be an uh, archive, but I think, uh, I hope reading those stories will uh, help readers, Asian or others, to know more about the history. I think that's the thing. And to see that those, the people were enslaved, because I'm writing about slavery, were human beings. That's the bottom line. They were human beings and they have a lot of emotion and feelings like everybody else, you know? That's, that's what I can say. <laughs> well, I think uh, in terms of the beauty and spirituality for me, I think um, the, where those meet is, is in that space and creativity where we almost feel like vessels where this thing comes in and you're just not sure where it comes from. So for me, that's 
a spiritual experience, if you will, um, in the sense like when you're lost in that story and it's almost like a trance, right? And then you're like, you have to put it all down and you can't sleep. And so I, I, think, I think there's definitely, you know, there, there's a spiritual element to, to all kinds of creativity where something comes through um, that you are just recording. That's when it's going um, very well. But in terms of, of archives, I, I'm always interested in, for me, what's most fascinating about the archives is sometimes the lacune, like what's not there um, and sort of the gaps. And, and so those are sort of the historical places that interest me. And then you go and fill in. So you might be like, a line in one very big book about one character and that's the person I want. <laughs> like that's the one I wanna know about. And then of course you have to do a more sort of classic side of like digging. Um, but I love mm -hmm. those, I love those spaces that, I love those types of things that leave a, a spot for the imagination for you to expand on, right? There's just like, like ten, almost tangential mention in a bigger story that's usually where I want, I feel like I want to, I'm usually like trying to go. That reminds me of Saidia Hartman, right? The hidden girls of the archive, like who are yeah. they? Okay, so we have two wonderful questions that I'm going to combine. Um, so uh, we have Philippe Julien, Philippe Julien who says, si nous mettons confiance dans l'enfant ici en Haïti, nous pensons que nous sommes capables de jouer une solution pour problème qui existe dans le pays. Um, so if we put confidence in Haitian women, if we put our trust in Haitian women, we can find solutions to all the problems. And I want to combine that with this question about the Madame Sa the Madame Sarah film. Um, it said, did Madame Trouillot mention a movie called Madame Sarah about a Haitian woman? Thank you. And I'm combining those because actually last night I did this thing with Etan and for University of Pennsylvania. And somebody asked like, well, what is the solution? Like, how should we, how can we make sure the Madame Sarah are put in a society recognized and protected. And I was like, well, we have to let them come up with the solution, right? So I feel like maybe one of you can talk a little bit about, because, you know, talk, I know, Evelyn, you, you just attended it, and Evelyn, you're obviously very involved in it. So talk about Madame Sarah and talk about Haitian it, women's um, solutions, so, right? um, <laughs> putting Haitian women at the center of our, our solutions for the country. Well, Edwish, Edwish participated in the first uh, viewing of the movie because I, I saw it twice and the first time Edwish was there. So Edwish, you can... <laughs> oh, no. I mean, I think, I think the movie... I mean, there, there are so many untold stories still in Haitian life, right? And that the story of the Mother Sarah is certainly one. And, and when Eta, you know, approached me and we started talking about it, I thought that was such a wonderful idea. Um, because so many of us have Madame Sarah in our lineage, right? That it's like these women, for those who have not seen the film, who really, uh, it's uh, who wake up at dawn with products, bring oh. them to the, and it has different scales, but they're super entrepreneurs, but who've also, uh, who've raised, you know, sent people to school, who've raised family, but have also suffered greatly recently with the markets burning. And so it's, it's a story that, that goes through it. You can tell the, the story of Haiti as well. And the film does from you know, the time in, uh, of enslavement with which portrait parallel Rosalie Lafemme to, to today, to what's happening with your neo-colonial policies. And, 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 and this is an opportunity to celebrate something that I feel like we could, and I agree with Phil Julia, like if we believe in like, like local led solutions, there is one right that we can reinforce that we can recreate that we can learn from that we can that we can support um so it is a powerful an example and 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 it's also a very i think powerful powerful film and the, the thing is i think that um uh, ad will not be able to to develop or grow if we don't if we don't include women in the process you know, and fully, we're, and women of all, you know, social classes, categories, and Madame Sarah, and try to find a way to protect those women because they work without protection, without any, you know, really uh, uh, state or local, you know, um, how do you say that? Uh, 
any support, uh, support. support you know to and, and this is this is very very difficult life this is a very difficult life and i think uh, we should uh, try to find a way you know with them to find a way with them on how to you know protect them and make them you know move forward and AD will really really develop if we include all those ways of life because we have to find a way to to take into account the realities you know you cannot come with our ideas from other places and try to put them into AD that's what they've been trying to do for a long time it doesn't work like that you know we have to find our own ways you know but they have to be fair to everybody yeah so there are um uh speaking of kind of making couplets of and questions and combining questions um uh there are two more one attendee who um it, uh, the name isn't listed but in essence is um not only was talking about your respective works but states i'm beginning to write a history of women and the haitian revolution what do you believe history slash historians have to learn from writers to write history as well and particularly any advice <laughs> for this attendee in crafting this history. So I take this question to be one in terms of what is the role of history and what do historians or people doing historical work, uh, what can they learn from uh, writers such as, uh, such as yourself? Wonderful question. Um, and then uh, there is uh, another question from uh, Natalie uh, Frederic uh, Pierre, uh, who not only thanks you for the conversation, but states, how can we use these new technologies to offer up new options for the young women in Haiti, and perhaps even uh, the working poor diaspora who make desperate choices that, uh, that lead to more poverty entrenchment. So I, I take it this question to be about how can, you know, we didn't imagine necessarily doing this over Zoom, but at the same time, we're connecting not only in Haiti, but also in, with the diaspora, with different institutions and individuals. So um, how can these newer technologies amidst the pandemic, as Regina is saying, we're in a pandemic, but how can, in some sense, we take this opportunity to actually um, uh, try and address certain policy issues that uh, have difficult choices, right? Okay. I will, I will answer the, the first question because I work uh, a lot with historians because, and um, in that sense, I'm lucky. I'm lucky to find historians who are willing to read what I write and say, "Well, yeah, this was uh, this this goes with the context." But this, I, I'm not sure about it. But the thing is, I can go so far in my writing and in my uh, interpretation of history. Historians cannot do it. They have to stick. They have to be. They have to. They have to be very respectful of the facts. I don't have to be as a writer. I have to respect the context and what is possible. And I can use my imagination to go as far as I can. For example, in Desiree Congo, you have the love between two women. And there is nothing, I didn't find anything in my reading that said there were such things in, in Sedouin at the time. But I said, if there are people, if there are people, going by and living. I'm sure there were men who love women and there were women who love women and there were men who love men because we are talking about human beings. I don't care if it was in 1750 or 1803. Eh? <laughs> and the historian said, well, you're right. We don't have any proof, but we don't have any proof that it, that it didn't exist. And that's the beauty, that's the liberty that I have. But the historian cannot do it. They have to go to the documents and find the proof, you know? The, that I think is uh, uh, what they can learn is to maybe use the fiction and go look for that themselves as historian. You know, in that way I can push them, you know, <laughs> the, the writer can push them to go and look for what is not there. You go and look for it, you know? I think it, I think it's a it's a very challenging relationship between the fiction historical fiction writer and the historian. You know. Yeah, but I see I so see I 
historians more and more, I think, narrating a text. And, and I think it started with someone you might or might not know, the, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Michel Rolf Tuyo, um, and silencing the past. <laughs> I think he, I think he started down that that road um, in terms of making history like real, um, you know, uh, and yes. personal. So I think that would be for the the uh, young historian who's writing that history. And I think also um, Baina Bello does does it too, and it's like she brings these narratives to life. Um, so I think always remember that it is, it is, you're telling us a, a story, I guess. Um, uh, and there are, there are threads to, there are things that link us to the present, but, um, I think those are two of sort of like the most living examples of his, of like, like history. Um, there are some, there are many others, you know, Marlene Doubt, who is engaging like mm -hmm. contemporary like who's watching Bridgerton for us, right? <laughs> um, and questioning that. Uh, so I think it's just thinking of it as like a constant conversation uh, that like history is never dead, you know, uh, that, it's, that it's sort of uh, ongoing. So we're, we are, our time is up and there's so many wonderful questions. I wanna give a special shout out to my students in tropical ecologies who have so many questions. It's like they think they're gonna get extra credit, which is amazing. <laughs> this was not the plan, but you know, I'm gonna give it to you. Um, I wanna just move to this quick question from our beloved friend, Dr. Kira Malika Daniels, Kiki. Um, and she has a question about um, keeping in mind your inspired works on young Haitian girls. How do you understand the, the sacred relationship between children and the elders in society? In other words, how do you portray children and elders in conversation with one another? And after that, we have to end. But thank you so much for all of the questions. And we can save the chat. So maybe we can find a way to give them to our, to our guests. Well, I think uh, the conversation between the elders and the children uh, they have been a, a part of Asian culture, and it was a way to transmit our value, our cultural elements, and our history also. But uh, these days, unfortunately, like everybody, like everywhere else, you know, we have less time for quick crack. <laughs> it's more like cell phone crack. <laughs> but I think uh, what we, we have. Yeah, to the day is a, a collection of the of the tales, the folk tales that we have, and people are working on that, you know, in on, on that point to 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 collect them and print them, so they will not be, you know, uh, completely lost. I think it's important, and in my in my writing, I think I have a lot. I I suffer that, you know. I have always a grandmother talking to. I love that. I love that. Totem, and then I think about Le Totem, right? And also, yeah, so much. It's beautiful. Yeah, I have that. And sometimes the grandmother is not a typical grandmother like in Le Totem, but it's always there to, 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 give, to give, you know, to, to, to give, a, yes, sorry, <laughs> to, to let the, the children or the young know about the past, about history, about what was what was before and how the how they how they see the how they see life and how they see the, themselves and I think it's important. Yeah, I think here too, like in I think in in diaspora, there's always like here uh, efforts to recreate that. Like so, there are programs before the pandemic with storytelling, but um, that trend, you know, that transition, like when I when I. I mean, there is still like there's when I spend time with like my mother-in-law in, in the country, there is that still the elder is still at home, right? Mm -hmm. And there there is that they're not like listening. You don't see as much like the, they're, the kid is as much on the phone as the kid here, but um, but at least there's the presence of the elder, right? And and some of it that I think in diaspora we try very hard to recreate and and storytellings and like, for example, for my girl, it's very natural to have a, a, an older woman in the house at all times. And, and there's like a natural transition that comes to that if, you, if you're lucky enough to have that. So, I mean, I think we might have in diaspora to force it a little bit to like to seek those elders sometimes, 
we have to go find the elders, but, um, but it's, 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 it, it's part of this continuity, right? That we're trying, like it's part of um, what we're trying to, to maintain and keep in terms of like a, a kind of continuity and that will bring our children back from here to, you know, to, 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 to know the, the country, to know the culture, to, to, be, to know themselves. Well, we could go on for hours and hours and hours, but, um, but we have to conclude. But uh, I first would like to say on behalf of not only Williams College, but the W. Ford 50 uh, Human Program in Democratic Studies to thank um, uh, Evelyn Churillo, uh, Edwis Danticat, and our moderator, uh, Professor Regine John Charles, uh, and to thank all of you uh, who tuned in, uh, and so we will, uh, we were able to record this. And so uh, hopefully soon for those who weren't able to join us, uh, we can make that available. And also even looking at the chat, um, there were participants even in Japan. So there, this really was a conversation um, that had literally spanned um, the globe. And it's very important, again, coming back to um, in conjunction with International Women's Day that um, we're thinking about the Caribbean, we're thinking and talking about Haiti and, uh, and diaspora, but we're also uh, thinking about women and girls and also how uh, this conversation in literary form, in historical forms, in the archives um, pertains to not only our past, um, as Monsieur Rolf Trio says, but, uh, but getting beyond silence and disavowed uh, past uh, for our present. And so um, thank you all. Uh, and in the name of thinking about justice, um, uh, uh, we say goodbye and still do, uh, do that great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Regine. Thank you, Raveline. Bye-bye. Right. Merci tout le monde.